All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, and uh, we looked at the first uh, part of the chapter, and we'll finish up the second half uh, today. Uh, again, we co of course, we know this is our, our, our dear apostle, Apostle Peter, that was one of the three chosen close apostles of, of Jesus, uh, Peter, James, and John. That just falls off our tongue as we read in Scripture. You know, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and did this and did that, and, and they were his closest associates. And now Peter is writing to his people here, and of course to us as we sort of look over their shoulder and read the letter that was written almost 2,000 years ago. And Peter has told us that God has given us everything we need for a life of godliness, everything we need for a good life. And we, we're lacking nothing. And let's not go seeking uh, uh, hidden secrets underneath the rocks that uh, somebody might dream up of uh, for that. And he's given us our very, very, very wonderful promises just beyond what we can understand uh, how God unites us with Jesus and he gives us eternal life. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and on and on we could go. It's just over overwhelming the promises God has for us. Peter asked us to, to be diligent, to, to strive to be like Jesus, to ask Jesus to fill our hearts as we grow in Him. <clears throat> Just to get the big picture, we're going to read chapter 1 beginning with verse 10 and through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> we'll just read all of it at one time and then we'll go back and look at it a little bit more. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll point out <clears throat> in verse 10, uh, your, your version may refer to, to brothers, uh, and that, that word includes brothers and sisters, male and female. Uh, and my version was, was updated new enough that it, it, it says brothers and sisters uh, as, it, as it reads here, okay? Uh, chapter 1, verse, verse 10. Peter says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in, in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts and above all you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things for prophecy never had its origin in the human will the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All right, uh, we'll go back to verse 10 to begin with. He, uh, the old version is make your calling and election sure. He encourages people to, to uh, make sure that, that they're, they're on the right path. Um, <clears throat> Peter says, yes, we're, 
we're called. God calls us. Yes, He's chosen us. He's known ahead of time and, and, and all of that uh, for our salvation. But make sure of that. Meaning, not, not worry that you may slip and fall or worry that you might not have done something just exactly right. But to be diligent, to be serious, to be dedicated, um, to be serious about this, this, this calling. And he says, you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. So you may say, well, yes, I know. You know, God's called us and God's made us secure. But yet Peter, Peter says, be serious about this. Be diligent and active. Well, even in the first chapter, I'm sorry, the first book of, of Peter, 1 Peter, Peter says the very same thing. He says, you know, God has called you to this glorious calling of salvation. But later on he says, God has called us to holy living. God wants us to be holy just like He is holy. And we talked about that. And I think this is what Peter wants to remind us. Yes, God's wonderful call. God's wonderful promises. He's granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But just be serious and pay attention and continue. Okay. Now, Peter is aware of his demise. Aware of his own death. He calls it his tent that he's living in, this, this imperfect, temporary uh, dwelling place of God. We call it the body. And we read elsewhere that sometimes our bodies is, is called a, a tent or a tabernacle, something that is not meant to be permanent. And oh, how we need that lesson. We have homes. We have savings. And we have retirement plans. And we have social security. And we have health insurance. And we have this and that. And we're so secure, we think. And then we see a plane fly into the World Trade Towers. And all that evaporates. And it's worthless. And you see, Peter says, I don't know when my end is going to come. I know it's going to come soon. But I want to leave a legacy here. And he's talking about scripture. He's talking about words written on a page. And this is so wonderful. And you know, we look around us and as we make out our wills to leave our effects to our kiddos or charity or nieces and nephews or whoever or whatever, you know, it's all print on paper and we, we sign and we go on. And that, that's good, that's, that's proper, and that's the way to do it. And yet we must realize that our, our, our legacy is not something we leave physically. It's not land or money or cars or wealth. But it's how we've touched people how we've touched people, especially our families. If we've had kiddos, we hopefully are proud of them and how they've turned out and that they're godly people. And you know, you think about Jesus. What did he leave? You know, he didn't leave a thing on this earth of material wealth. But he left us riches, the riches of the promises that we talked about last week that are just beyond value that just overwhelm us. And this is what Peter is trying to tell us now. When he says in verse 12, I, I want to remind you of these things. Even though you already know them and you're firmly established in them, but, but I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I'm in this tent of my body because I'll soon put it aside as Jesus has told me. And I will make every effort, verse 15, to see that my depart and after my, my departure you will always be able to remember these things. That's why he wrote scripture. We read elsewhere where some of our, our writers uh, of, of the New Testament letters says, Well, I, I want to come see you, but 
in lieu of that, since I can't come see you, I'm going to write this letter. It's not as good as being face to face, but I'm going to write you this letter. And I believe our, our brother John uh, writes some of his letters as he, as he closes out and says, this letter is, is second rate to being in person, but I want you to know this. I'm going to write it for you. All right, when we're thinking about legacy and everything, some of the things that mean the most to us in our families are not, not money, as we said, or house, but it's little mementos of things that were precious to our previous generations. Uh, I could list off uh, uh, three or four that are, that are special in, in my family. Uh, you know, an old, old piece of uh, tool, a tool from the 1800s that, uh, I don't know, I guess it was my great-grandfather used to build fence with, and, and uh, I have an old shotgun he had that came from England, and uh, uh, I have a, a pocket watch of a grandfather that was, he said, during church when the sermon got too long, the, the little kids would play with his pocket watch to be entertained, this kind of stuff. That's, that's stories, that's legacy. And here's Peter saying, I, I, I know you know all this, but be reminded, and I want you to know all this, remember all this after I'm gone. <sighs> And as we watch this weekend, some of the retelling of September 11th, 2001 story, uh, you saw the poor people in New York City days afterwards carrying around, you know, a picture of my wife, a picture of my husband. Have you seen her? Have you seen him? Is there a possibility that he or she is in a hospital somewhere? We can't find them. And we know the answer to all that, sadly, was no. They're not going to be found. This is a memento. This is, a, this is something that we, we, we cherish. And we have these in our own family. And Peter says, I want you to think about this spiritually, to remember these things after I'm gone. <clears throat> Pause here. Any any comment or question there? Okay. Peter says we did not follow any kind of clever myth or fable or fairy tale or stories. We were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ. He says in verse 16, we did not follow some cleverly devised myth or story when we told you about the coming of Jesus and power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he, uh, he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom, I'm, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And Peter says, We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on this uh, sacred mountain. Peter says here that our faith is founded in facts. It's not based on anybody's story or vision that they might claim, but on facts. Our faith is based on facts. And as we've said before, if we were to write a story, a fairy tale fable about some great hero or whatever in the past, it would be a perfect story of everybody having perfect lives and a sanitized version of everybody being perfect, right? You can read the Old Testament and New Testament for just a few minutes and read, and read very clearly that those were not perfect people. Warts and all, as we would say, the story is given of people struggling to follow God and failing, failing miserably. And one of the worst is Peter. 
He denied his Lord Jesus Christ three times. And Jesus was within earshot of that. And after the third time, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And I'm sure with eyes that would make you cry. And that's what Peter did. He went out and wept bitterly, Scripture says, because he realized what he had done. Peter was a failure. And yet he's the man here that has been reborn into the man that led the early Christian church that stood in, 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 in the square in, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and says, men and brethren, this, this man whom you crucified, God has now made him Lord, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And unashamedly, Peter went forward. And you see, it's easy for me to jump on the bandwagon of, of, a, of a movement or, a, or a, of a mob or a protest or whatever and, and go along with the crowd until it begins to cost me my life. And when it begins to cost me my life, I, ha I have to say, wait a minute, what kind of a cause am I into? I'm all for this issue or that issue, but if it asks me to <clears throat> maybe put my life on the line, I need to rethink this. And you look at the martyrs, those who were killed, even Peter. The story is that Peter was crucified upside down. The story is said that he said, I am not worthy to be crucified right side up like my Lord, so crucify me upside down. That's, that's the tradition that we have of his death. It's, that's not in Scripture. But these were men and women that gave their lives. And you don't do that for a myth, okay? You don't do that for a myth. says we're eyewitnesses we didn't hear about it we saw it we touched it we lived it day in and day out earlier in the book of first peter chapter five he, peter says i'm a fellow elder and a witness of christ's sufferings he talked about being an eyewitness even in his previous book now peter says Remember a little incident that I told you about. He talks about the voice coming from heaven, booming from heaven, that says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Or listen, listen to Him. That's the story of what we call the transfiguration. It's a, it's a little story. It's very, very interesting. And I thought I would, I would read it. It's very short. I'll read it in just a moment. But this is the time that, that the voice came from, from heaven, Peter says. And we heard it saying, this is my son. I love him. And now listen to him. And he says, we ourselves heard this voice when we were with him on the mountain. Uh, this, was, this was recorded in, all, in three Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, Gospels. And let me just read it. And it's, 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 it's very interesting. Jesus calls Matthew, uh, Peter, James, and John, his three closest. And they go up on, to a mountain. They get on top of the mountain. And it, it seems like Peter, James, and John either were overwhelmed or they're a little bit dazed but they didn't quite hear all that went on at the time but Moses and Elijah appeared and talked to Jesus and what did they talk about they talked about his Jesus's upcoming death cross in Jerusalem and actually the word that is, is used that their discussion was Jesus's exodus well, who led the exodus of the Egyptian uh, people uh, 
holding the Jewish people as slaves and letting them out, leading them out to the Red Sea. That was Moses, the great emancipator, the great liberator, the great leader. Moses was talking to Jesus about Jesus' own exodus, his own leaving. Wonderful. Just can you imagine what they talked about? And here was Elijah, one of the spokesmen for God in the Old Testament. We call him a prophet. And Elijah was probably the A number one prophet in the Old Testament uh, in, in his time. And he was the one that sat down under a shade tree and said, Lord, kill me. I'm the last one that has a bow to knee to this idol Baal. Just, just kill me. God says, no. I have 7,000 others that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Come on, Elijah. Be strong. And he, and he was. And here was Elijah talking with Jesus about his coming death. Now you see, as we have said, one of the greatest blessings God has given us is not knowing when we are going to die. If we knew the date we were going to die, we would worry and worry and worry and worry leading up to that. Unbelievable. It would be torture. But one of the greatest blessings God has given us is that we do not know the date of our death, right? Jesus knew the date of His death. And He knew it. He could see it. He knew the cross. He knew the suffering. Can you imagine the torture in his mind and heart as he faced that day. And here is Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus about that. Don't know what about to help him get through. I don't know. We'll have to ask in heaven. But, but Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to go up on the mountain with him. And Scripture tells us that they were sort of either, either dazed or overwhelmed and, and they sort of woke up and one, one version, one, one account says that they didn't quite hear all the discussion. They were sort of sleepy and they didn't quite hear all this discussion, but poor Peter wakes up and says, oh my, it's, it's nice for us to be here. Let's, let's build a, a little tent or a shelter or a booth for, for you three guys, Moses and Elijah and Jesus, and, and let's sort of make a memorial up here. And that's when this voice from heaven comes over. It's almost, almost a little humorous. God says, he's my son. I love him very much. You listen to him. He sort of straightens Peter out. And, and Peter probably says, yes, sir. Uh, that's, our, that's our story. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before him, them, Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then in parenthesis, the next verse says, he did, know, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Poor Peter just sort of blurted something out because he was ill at ease and uh, unsure of himself and just sort of suggested something. And then a cloud appeared and covered them and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And then as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. You see this, you see this 
this whole situation as a rebuttal of Peter. It was an embarrassing moment for Peter when he, <coughs> when he has to be corrected by God Almighty with a booming voice from heaven. Peter mentions this directly in his letter. And even though it was an embarrassing moment for Peter, Peter says, that doesn't matter. I want you to know that we saw the glory of God. I want you to know that we saw the shining face, the glowing face of Jesus. It doesn't matter what I did. I blew it. And I, I, I didn't know what I was saying. I just made a suggestion that God didn't like and he, he corrected me. And yet Peter sees the almighty majesty of God as worth so much more than that. He's willing to say, I did it wrong, but that doesn't matter. We heard the voice, the voice that corrected me, the, the voice that straightened me out. And I want you to know that. These, 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 these are not myths. We saw it. We heard it. And that's what I want you to know. And I think this is so indicative of the changed mind, the changed heart that Peter had. Uh, very interesting. And, and did you notice, again, Jesus says, now don't tell anybody about this until after I'm resurrected from the dead. Did Peter, James, and God... Peter, James, and John get it? No. It says they discussed among themselves what does it mean to be raised from the dead? They didn't get it. Now, did Jesus purposely cloud their minds a little bit so that they really couldn't get it until after the resurrection? I don't know. We don't know. But as we say, on crucifixion day when they saw Jesus crucified we had hoped he was the one but I guess we were wrong I don't know and then by Sunday morning the resurrection it all began to come into place and they said oh yes didn't our hearts burn within our within us as Jesus explained the scriptures to us. Oh yes. Now I know what he means when he says. I was going to be killed and then resurrected. And it all made sense. And Peter becomes the Peter of the New Testament gospel. And that's such a wonderful story. Okay. Any comment or question there? Yes. You know when I first started studying. Uh, I was always told that anything that's repeated must be important. Mm -hmm. And these are exactly the same words that, G that the Holy Spirit said, or God said at Jesus' baptism. Exact same words. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That means it's very important when Jesus was baptized and also transfigured. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's encouraging for those of us who all fail that Peter had this experience yes. and many others, and yet he did, yes. under pressure, deny that he knew who Jesus was. I mean, but then he turned around and was the most zealous. Yes. Oh. You know, we've all known people that had so much energy you just couldn't put a harness on them but they were in the wrong direction. If you can ever get that energy, you turn around and get in the right direction, you, you got a winner on your side. That was Peter. Absolutely. He was, he was a racehorse. Absolutely. All right. Verse 19 and following. <clears throat> Peter would tell us, look, our faith is not only founded on facts, but it is founded on fulfilled prophecy what has been predicted in the Old Testament has come and has come true so not only did we hear it not only were we eyewitnesses but everything we're telling you has been predicted and come true 
Verse 19 says, we have this prophetic message as something completely reliable. He says, pay attention to it. Just as daybreak begins to, to light, uh, you know, we, we, we know how dawn comes and the first ray of light becomes available that we could see. Can you imagine in this day and time, of course, there's no electric lights and it was dark at night, big time dark. And that's the image that we have in the New Testament. You know, goodness is light, evil is darkness, and God is the light and all this. We, we, we know this image. And this is sort of what Peter's telling us, you know. Uh, just as light comes to a dark place, uh, the, the, the day dawns and, and the morning star rises in your hearts. And he, he says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on this earth, he explained to his followers, time after time, prophetic fulfillment. The scriptures. The early preaching in Acts of Peter and the other apostles. This is fulfilled prophecy, they would say. The day of the Lord that's been predicted is now come upon you. And they would quote from the Old Testament. And Peter says, this is true. And even in the, I'm sorry I'm referring back to 1 Peter a little bit, but in 1 Peter, we were told that the prophets of old longed to look into the message that they were delivering and they, they couldn't, couldn't quite figure it out. But he says, now it's, we, we realize it's revealed to us all that long prophetic mystery is now revealed here, he says. And by mystery, I'm not talking about some hard puzzle to figure out that only the smartest can do and the insights of of secret interpretations. No, the mystery is just pulling back the curtain. That's all it is. When we talk about the mystery revealed in the New Testament, it's nothing more than pulling back the curtain and say, here it is. It's plain. Okay, that's what he means there. And he says, those who, who spoke God's word were God's people, even though they were human. Wasn't their intellect, smartness, devised myths or whatever. It was God working in them to give the interpretations of Scripture and prophecy as we have. <coughs> and he says that these people were sort of carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the image there being carried along is sort of interesting because you know the Holy Spirit uh, same word for spirit as as wind and the image here is sort of like a boat a sailboat being carried along by the wind the prophets of the Old Testament were carried along by the wind of God the Holy Spirit <coughs> Peter just just sums up by saying, look, we're sure of our message because, number one, of the facts, we were eyewitnesses. And number two, of fulfilled prophecy. No way around it, and I want you to remember this after I'm gone. <laughs>